look at this beautiful green and blue ball and try to find where you are located. Where are you from? Anyway, have you ever wondered how this beautiful planet was formed? Well, let's actually try to recreate this today by using Universe Sandbox 2. Welcome to What The Math, so today we're going to be making an Earth. Now, in the previous video that was about Ceres and Vesta and other dwarf planets, I mentioned that Ceres and Vesta were actually protoplanets. If you actually go in here, this is Ceres. Ceres is a protoplanet. What does it mean? Well, it means that it, uh, a lot of other planets were made out of chunks like this. So this is kind of like the building blocks or the building block of many, many planets. So let's see if we can actually simulate this by creating a miniature solar system. Let's just say we're going to place a very, very small star in the middle. No, or not even a star. Let's actually place um, a red main sequence dwarf, also known as Wolf 359. This is one of the closest red dwarfs to our planet, uh, to our solar system. And what we're going to do is we're going to place a bunch of... Um, minor objects, specifically dwarf planets around it. So it's going to be a lot of Ceres flying around. Actually, I'm going to pause this for a second. So let's place a lot of Ceres here, or maybe even closer than that. And then we're going to also place uh, a few Plutos because Plutos are cool and they're dwarf planets as well. Let's place a few Ereses or Eris. And of course, Vesta. Vesta, I have to look up here. Uh, because Vesta is not listed by itself. And the reason I'm placing so many different ones is because um, they have different compositions. So Vesta has mostly rocky stuff. It's, uh, it's, it's literally an asteroid, so it has a lot of rocky stuff in it. Whereas um, things like Ceres have a lot of water. So it's one third water, so it does have quite a lot of, quite a, quite a large content of water. Now to make this a little bit more interesting, let's actually change the uh, motion, or specifically the eccentricity of orbit of some of these objects, because in the early solar system, they weren't really all circular orbits. A lot of the orbits here were misaligned, they were a lot less circular, so we're, we're going to simulate this by adding a little bit of eccentricity to some of these orbits. And just to add another really cool random effect, we're going to put at least one, or let's just, let's just put one moon in here. We're going to put moon right somewhere in the middle because some objects were formed a lot faster and so some objects were a lot larger than other objects. I'm going to put moon right here in the middle and all of this is going to start orbiting each other at speed of, I don't know, some speed, minutes per second. This is minutes per second. Uh, we're going to actually accelerate this a little bit. Uh, let's actually remove the trails and watch this beautiful procession. So. What do you predict will happen? Oh, here we go. Here's our first collision. Pluto and I think maybe another Pluto collided with each other. And uh, basically what will happen now, I think at least, a lot of them will start colliding. They'll start interacting with each other. They'll start smashing in. And at some point they will start forming a really interesting system. So this was all kind of randomly placed, but they will eventually reach a balance where many of them will, will have a circular kind of an orbit. And then many others will actually either fly out of the system or uh, become really interesting large objects. So let's see if this actually works for us. Uh, I'm just going to look at a chart for a second because this shows us the comparison of size. Now, here we go. So this is, look at that, something else just collided, something else just collided again. You can actually see it here. And these are the objects we have currently have. So the moon is the largest one, and it's already a little bit bigger than before. And what, and what you're observing right now is them colliding with each other. So let's let's watch that from here, because it's a lot more fun just watching, watching them smack into each other. And just for fun, let's actually, um, I'm going to try to find the moon, and we're going to go to the moon and observe things from its perspective. So let's see what it looks like from the moon. Uh, let's see if something actually smashes into us and you can see a lot of things already kind of start happening right there. Um, and we're gonna just wait, wait and see until things get a little bit more heated. And look at that, just like that, something just hit the moon as well. So the moon is just a little bit larger, I think, or is it? Maybe not. 
I think I actually lost a chunk. Whoa, it actually lost a chunk, so now it's only 99% of its mass because something was so large that it actually knocked something out of the moon. Uh, so, and this is how the moon even got those craters that it currently has because a lot of things early on were basically hitting it at all times. And there's another collision right here. You can see there are remains and the fragments flying around. And so let's just watch this. We're going to accelerate this a little bit more as they keep hitting each other and creating larger and larger objects. And you can kind of see that there's quite a lot of collisions happening, even though the actual orbits were relatively circular, collisions happen at all times. So early on when the solar system was just developing and there were all these rocks flying around, um, they were basically just doing that. They were interacting with each other, obviously a lot slower than, than it is here, but uh, the collisions occurred quite regularly, sometimes even many, uh, many collisions per year uh, as the Earth was developing and combining into this one large spherical piece of rock and iron. So it's been 33 days and you can see the uh, amount of these objects is slowly decreasing as they're smacking into each other and combine with each other. Here come more collisions and you can see only after 39 days we've already lost quite a few of these objects. Um, and you can tell the ones that have actually been collided with by their glowing aura. So this one right here had quite a lot of collisions. It's already actually approaching the size of the moon. And this is Pluto, of course. And uh, the other ones are right here and there's a little bit more smaller objects like Vesta and Ceres and there's a bunch of fragments flying around as well so one by one they're disappearing because they're combining with each other let's actually watch this from from this perspective instead and no not this perspective this perspective and what we want to see is how they're actually uh, slowly disappear because um, the irregularity in, in the orbits, as, a, along with the fact that there's just so many objects flying around, will eventually cause them to become one. And what will happen is the largest object, specifically the most massive object, will very likely kick everything out of its orbit. So when Earth was just formed, it was the most massive object in the orbit. Because of its mass, it was able to kick everything else out. So whatever else was flying in its orbital path or near it, either collided with it or got kicked out into the outer solar system. And many objects like, for example, Ares or Makemake, which are on the other side of solar system, may have been actually originally from orbit of Earth or any other planet that was actually being formed in, in this particular manner. So here's our friend Moon that's it's still kind of hot but it's actually it hasn't had any new collisions and it hasn't actually increased its mass at all. It lost a chunk. It lost 1% of its mass and here's another collision which added uh, just a little bit actually. Or maybe it actually decreased. Whoa, the moon actually lost a piece again. Interesting. So I think that was a fragment colliding with the moon that made it decrease its mass again. Uh, now, right now, we uh, our biggest object is right here. And it is the moon, I think. Yes, it's the moon. And then the second biggest object is Pluto, which is about 77% mass of the moon. So let's watch them as they collide with each other and you'll notice that most of them will have, have had some sort of collision already except for the uh, few lucky ones but they will slowly disappear as well as I increase time. So after about 120 days we've lost about a third of all of our objects that we placed initially. Even maybe more than that, I think it's almost like a half of the objects that are already gone. And the collisions happen quite regularly at least every few days. There's another one right here. Something just became much bigger. There's a very large fragment and it just collided with something else again. So every few days we get a collision. Now, uh, obviously it wasn't this fast in, in real life. In real life this took many million years and uh, all of these objects were flying a lot farther apart from the actual uh, center of the sun or center of the solar system. They were flying away... Uh, they were flying around uh, in larger distances as well, and their or orbits were a lot more unpredictable. But nevertheless, this is kind of how it all started. But the other thing I wanted to actually mention is, if you look really closely, you'll notice that there's a lot of fragments that are flying in a very eccentric orbit really far away from, from the central sun, or from Wolf 359. Now, these fragments were kicked out of their original orbit, which was very close to the sun, and have now assumed very eccentric, very kind of uh, elliptical orbits. Now, if you ever look at the map 
of our solar system, you'll notice that um, a lot of dwarf planets like Ares, Makemake, Haumea, all of them have orbits that are very similar. They have very eccentric, very far away orbits. Um, and what this suggests is that maybe this is exactly how they were formed. Instead of becoming protoplanet chunks, they were kind of kicked out and they were uh, just not accepted by the planets, I guess. They were kind of... Uh, they were told to leave and to never come back from the central solar system. But really, what, what happened is they were probably kicked out in the same manner that I lost my fragments and became these really, really far objects just kind of orbiting in um, in the Oort cloud as it's known today. Um, and that's very likely how they were formed as well. After about a year, one of the Aries right here has become the leader in mass. So this is possibly what will become our main planet in this region because it has now acquired mass of about 10% higher than original Moon and Moon has actually lost a lot of chunks. So Moon is no longer a contender. But this Aries right here is potentially what will be the largest object in this particular orbital field. And let's see if something... Oh, no, nothing happened. I thought maybe they will smack into each other. And this orb, uh, object right here, which we'll actually now name Earth, uh, very likely will become the main mass and also main um, gravitational pool in this region, thus obviously kicking out the rest or absorbing them into itself. And after a year and a half, you'll notice that a lot of orbits are completely chaotic. So if I actually look at the orbits here, here's what they look like. It started as a circle. They were mostly circular. And now look at that. This is amazing. One of the fragments is really far away. So this is actually something similar to Eris right here. Uh, one of the dwarf planets that we have in our solar system. And then the rest of them are in the middle. And uh, some of the orbits are very wobbly. That's because there's so many objects now that are very massive and they cause the orbits to constantly change. And at some point, all of these objects that, that are wobbly will obviously disappear and combine with much larger objects. And just look at how these orbits are constantly changing. They're almost like they're walking somewhere. So this red orbit, for example, which I think is... What is this? So let's find out. Okay, so it's a, just a fragment, not a very massive fragment. Its orbit is constantly changing until its orbit intersects with someone, or something that is. And at that point, it will obviously disappear. But while uh, there are objects influencing its orbit, uh, it, it's going to con continuously shift and uh, possibly even change its eccentricity. And if I go back to the chart here, you'll notice that we don't really have that many named objects left. So we have uh, a lot of objects that have become nothing but fragments. And all of these are actually fragments now. And these fragments are very, very, very massive as well. But majority of named objects have already collided with each other. There's really only one that hasn't had a collision. Only this series has been really lucky and hasn't had any collisions yet. But most of the other objects have experienced quite a volatile life. So this particular simulation, this really simple simulation, already demonstrates how complex the solar system can become if you have a bunch of rocks flying around in a kind of a circular orbit around each other and start, start influencing each other, start collapsing with each other and uh, their fragments start flying around everywhere. So our solar system was formed in a very, very similar fashion. So essentially, if I keep writing this for years and years and years, what you'll see is something very similar to our own solar system. But we are really only interested in uh, seeing how our Earth is doing. So let's actually go to our Earth. Let's find it. I don't even know where it is anymore. Um, there's so many different fragments flying around that I can't even see it. All right, so here is our Earth. It's all molten and beautiful, and its uh, its mass mass currently is 1.49 mass of the Moon. So this is the most massive object in this orbit, and this is why a lot of the other fragments have acquired such a eccentric orbit because its mass influences them. It, its mass kind of kicks them out. So if I were to go to the chart, you'll see that in comparison to this Earth. We don't really have anything else that's even close in terms of mass. So this here is about 94% of the moon. So I guess this is the closest and this is Pluto. 
and the rest of them are not as massive. So if I keep running this, which I'm going to do until we lose most of the massive objects, you'll notice that there's going to be very, very little left. And after almost two years, we only have two named objects left. We have this Earth that we created originally, and then we have Ceres right here. The rest of them have become just fragments. This is all fragments left towards from collisions. Some of them, they've been combined into larger fragments. This actually is quite a large fragment. And uh, with time, we'll, uh, they'll obviously either collapse into something else or possibly even fly out of the solar system or in this case, wolf system. So our Earth is now at 2.36 times the moon size, which is already a lot larger than the original moon. And um, only Ceres is left, so let's wait for it to actually disappear as well. And at that point, uh, we will have created uh, an Earth-like object flying around wolf uh, and so here is this last series, and it's actually approaching Earth relatively close. So at some point, Earth's gravity will actually uh, suck it in and it will become a part of it. And this is very likely how our moon was formed as well, because we know that there was a very large Mars-sized object that collapsed with our Earth, and it uh, left a fragment orbiting around Earth, which eventually became our moon. So this is very likely what will happen here, although we're not sure if this is going to create a fragment, but it will definitely leave a piece flying out into the outer, at, um, outer space, just like this fragment that you just saw passing by. And looks like our final series is gone. So there's nothing but Earth left now. And this Earth is 2.59 masses of the moon. Now this will obviously increase with time. But at this point, all we need to do is just uh, wait for all of these fragments to disappear, to either collapse or smack into Earth, or to fly into the outer atmosphere, uh, not atmosphere, outer solar system to basically create orbits just like you see here. So this is probably one of the farther ones with more, one of the more eccentric orbits. And so some of these will obviously um, remain as the dwarf planets flying around in the solar system. So now what we're going to do is let's just wait for this to cool down and let's see if we can terraform it to make it into a miniature Earth flying around Wolf 359. Now, I actually manually cooled it down just to accelerate things a little bit, but look at the materials in here. This is awesome. So it actually has 24% iron and about 76% silicates. It's relatively close to what Earth really has. And uh, of course, we're missing water here, so we're going to add that. And here we go. So this is the first start. Actually, no, maybe a little bit less than that. Too much water. Way too much water. All right, so this is looking pretty good so far. So we have grayish like terrain, and then we have a bunch of oceans and seas everywhere. We're missing uh, atmosphere. And let's make some atmosphere here, and let's give it uh, about one atmospheric pressure. That should be enough. And look at how beautiful this looks. It's greenish in hue, and it is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, Handmade earth, made from scratch. And then if we look into the sky, we'll see, well, apart from flying fragments that will probably cause a bunch of extinction events in the near future, we also might see our beautiful star, not really star, it's a protostar, called Wolf 3, uh, 359. Where is it? Ah, there it is. Look at that. It's Wolf Rise. Yeah, beautiful. All right, so this is what our Earth and our star looks like. We're a little bit too close to it, but it's actually not that hot. So that's why... Um, that's why our temperature right now is actually only about, oh, it's actually 100 degrees Celsius, but it's actually going to cool down with time. So anyway, so this is how Earth was very, very likely formed. And this is essentially how you can do it in Universe Sandbox 2. But let me just uh, do another quick simulation, a very similar simulation to what I, just, what I just did, but except that this time we're going to have not a singular star, but a binary star. So let's see what happens if you have a binary star. And we're going to add a wolf again, and this is going to be a binary wolf. So I'm going to pause the game here, add a binary wolf. So these are two binary stars orbiting each other. If I unpause it, you'll see how they start dancing around each other. And now let's add just the same. We're going to add a few objects, uh, specifically minor objects like Ceres and Vesta. Let's actually just add Ceres for now because it's a little bit easier. And place them everywhere around these two stars. 
Now watch what happens when I let this run. So it's a very similar simulation. There's a bunch of rocks flying around a star or two stars in this case. But look at that. Look at what two binary stars start causing. Because of their um, influence on each other, on other objects in space, this system becomes unstable really, really, really quickly. And if I keep running this, you'll notice that there will maybe be just one survivor, possibly not even that. So a binary system, like for example, Alpha Centauri, which is actually a trinary system, but there are two main stars that are relatively massive, uh, very likely does not have many objects flying around it, and it's very likely kind of empty-ish. There might be one or two planets, or protoplanets, or dwarf planets, that is, flying around it, uh, but it's very likely that there's really nothing else. So, looking into binary stars and trying to hope for uh, some sort of a Earth-like planet in, that, in a binary star system, is very very unlikely so here if i keep running this i'm going to just remove the uh trail so that you can see that eventually all of these poor dwarf planets will actually fly into the outer system and will disappear forever there might be one or two with a very eccentric orbit that will ev eventually or is um with time settle into orbit around around wolves I guess I'm going to call them wolves. I can't really see it this way. We're going to look at the trails. I remove orbits. Um, so, yeah, they might have one or two, but very unlikely to have more than that. And specifically, they're more uh, very unlikely to have the same sort of development of planetary bodies like we just experienced with just one wolf. And here we go. This is 100 days later. So let's see what has happened in the system. So we start with about... Oh, something just collapsed into the one of the stars. Uh, we started with about 100 bodies, and possibly a little bit less than that, and most of them have actually departed. They've flown into the outer uh, solar system, and they've probably either uh, escaped solar system completely, or maybe joined some other solar system somewhere far, far away. Now, what we have around these binary stars is we have two Ceres bodies that are kind of flying along and one Pluto right here, and one Pluto in, in the back, but they're not really doing anything. For, um, most importantly, they're not actually, um, they're not colliding, they're not creating planets. So these protoplanets are not developing into anything. So unfortunately, the binary star is probably not a very good source of having Earth-like planets, at least uh, according to the simulation right here. Anyway, so this is essentially how you can make Earth and Universe Sandbox 2, or in this case, how not to make Earth. If you have a binary star, you'll probably not succeed in making anything except for this very unstable, not-so-solar system, or binary system. And one of the previous videos where I talked about Alpha Centauri is very likely to be just as empty as this. There might be one planet, but it's very unlikely to be a habitable planet. Anyway, thank you guys for watching, please subscribe, check out some of the other Universe Sandbox 2 videos, and the link is on your screen right now. If you have any other suggestions, or you would like me to do some other video about some other awesome, amazing game that you really love, please post it in the comments below. Also, don't forget to check out my Twitch channel, where I have started Twitching every Saturday. It's uh, random times at right now, but there will be a schedule coming up soon. And finally, if you're not a subscriber yet, subscribe, because a lot of the videos will teach you so much about life, universe, and everything else. Thank you guys for watching, and game you later. Bye-bye.